Welcome to the Happy Homeschooler podcast, a digital support group for everyone interested in a learning lifestyle. I'm your host, Holly. I'm your co-host, Melody. Well, Melody, today we're going to be talking about teaching science for kinder through eighth grade students, but I'm interested to know what have you been doing lately? Oh, I've been packing. We have a move coming up. I might have mentioned that before. And so the packing has begun and my house is starting to be piled up with stacks of boxes because I was working on the books and trying to edit our collection, but it's so hard. Oh, books are like friends. It's so hard to say goodbye to them. I feel like they're, I'm sending them to a good home and it'll be okay. You know, I've called three boxes of books and put them into the hands of some new homeschoolers. And so I feel pretty good about that. But like you said, some of them are old friends that I'm just not ready to boot off my shelf yet. Right. I understand that completely. In fact, I um, have a part-time hobby as a book rescuer. So if I go to a thrift <laughs> store and I see something and I, I think, oh my gosh, I need to buy that and see if I can sell it or um, give it to somebody else. And then my son will see the book, which I had intended to sell. And he'll say, I really like that book. Oh, and I have to keep it. <laughs> so right. That's how I got into bulging. this situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, homeschoolers, we have a severe case of bibliophilia, and I don't think any of us really want to get over it. No, just, yeah, keep give me all the books. So all anyway, books. trying to pare down because we're moving into a little bit smaller space, or I won't have as many bookshelves, or I won't have as many feet of bookshelves, maybe. So oh, that's yeah. what I've been doing. How about you lately? What are y'all up to? Well, um, we are just enjoying school and in different types of activities. Um, yesterday we had a 4-H meeting and they had a pumpkin decorating contest. So um, we didn't prepare um, in advance as well as we should have. And my son was spray painting a pumpkin about three hours before the meeting. Oh. <laughs> so I never thought way, about spray painting a pumpkin. Well, yeah, he wanted, yeah, he wanted his pumpkin to be a famous Minecraft player uh, person who's called Dream. And Dream has a white mask with a somewhat bemused smiley face on it. So we had to paint the pumpkin white and then put the smiley face on with a Sharpie. Um, the only problem is, you know, spray paint, even though it might be dry to the touch, it's still pretty odiferous. And we <laughs> nearly asphyxiated ourselves driving over to the meeting. <laughs> and then something that's coming up soon is um, I've talked before about how we like to go to this symphony that's in our area called the Starlight Symphony and they have a Halloween concert that they perform every year and it's going to be outdoors. Kids can wear non-spooky costumes and they give the kids a chance to parade around. But when I saw the lineup of the pieces of music they were going to play, I got very excited because we study a composer for 12 weeks at a time. Um, we do three terms of school. And they're playing a piece by Camille Saint-Saëns, which is Danse Macabre. And we have been listening to that composer. So I'm oh. super excited to actually um, be able to go to um, a performance and recognize a piece of music we've been studying. I love it when regular course of life dovetails with a study like that. Yeah, it, it kind of makes it all, um, you know, really concrete. It's like, why do we study this so we can enjoy it when we hear it, so we can recognize it, so it's part of our lifestyle. So today we're going to be talking about teaching science uh, for kinder through eighth grade. And I think science is on everybody's mind because there's a big emphasis on teaching STEM. Um, and we've talked about STEM as part of a liberal arts education. And so today we're going to delve more into how we um, address the topic of teaching science. Melody, um, what does that mean to you when we're talking about teaching science for these grades? Well, for these grades, teaching science for us, like no matter what your overall curricular approach is, the best way to teach science in these lower grades is to get out of the way and let your kids experience it. For us, it, the learning is in the doing. So we did not take tests or have grades and we didn't really use like a traditional curriculum in the elementary years. Science is a topic to explore. In contrast to later on in high school when you're absolutely using a textbook and you kind of have a checklist of topics you want to make sure you cover in those four years of high school, in the early years it's much more open-ended um, and it looks like exploring things, collecting things, observing things, spending time in nature. 
Right. So when we're talking about science, we're not talking in, in this age group, especially in the early years, we're not talking about chemistry, biology, uh, those things. We're talking about the weather, the seasons, the stars, plants and animals. Right. So we are talking about chemistry and biology, but we're not calling them that. We're learning, you know, we're laying a foundation for later formal studies. Yes, and one of the ways we like to teach chemistry when my kids are younger is by baking. <laughs> Absolutely. I was just going to say I've got two books on my shelf about science in the kitchen and they have recipes. And then at the end, it has uh, what is the science behind like making mayonnaise or something like that. And so those were the most fun ways to learn science. It also made sure that they thought of science as something fun and something they look forward to. Yes, and in, in our household, we are really into uh, nature studies. And, you know, that is the study of so many different things. It encompasses plants and animals, and it encompasses the weather and the seasons and all kinds of stuff. And so um, we don't have a specific curriculum, but we have a lot of resources we use. So introducing st science to students is, is has to be fun in these early years. Well, they practically introduce it for you because it's like, mom, why this and what mm -hmm. is that? And all the questions. So you really want to be interruptible in the early years when they've got those questions to stop and say, let's find out or go get the field guide or remember to get a book the next time you go to the library or take advantage of something in your community if there's a class on something that they're interested in to jump in there because their motivation will just keep those studies going. Right. Um, it's almost impossible to keep kids from science just by everyday things. You know, why does this happen? Why does that happen? Like you said, and having a few things around magnifying glasses, some binoculars, like you said, and some field guides. It makes it easy for you to pick up their interest and run with it. What are some of the things that you have done when you're introducing science to your students, if you're doing it in an intentional way? Well, for us, because I'm, we've talked about learning styles and things like that before. I'm a planner. I'm a Paula. Um, I kind of sketched out like a month by month kind of thing. What might we study this month? And so we would do things like plan to study constellations in December because they're so much easier to see in the night sky. And there are some really recognizable ones in our area. And then we would plan water studies in the spring or summer. And maybe we would plan to study uh, leaves in the fall when they're all falling off the trees. Or we might study them in the spring or both where we're keeping an eye on on things. So like I would have a plan for what would be a good science study at this time of the year, depending on what the weather was doing. However, we could always stop and change directions if something interesting popped up. I mentioned before I used unit studies a lot. We used Konos and there were very, very hands on lots of science study in there. But I kind of went with those topics. But like most homeschoolers, had to modify it some. We're always changing things up, find something we love, and then tweak a little bit to make it fit better. But we would do things like that. We would study, like if there was a unit on sound, we would just explore how the ear works and all the different sounds, and we might uh, incorporate music and orchestra and that. Everything kind of flowed together, but we would have one overarching idea. How about you? Did you have a really uh, late, well laid out plan, or did you just go with the flow? Um, so we had both actually. So I've used um, some type of a curriculum all the whole time I've homeschooled my kids that gave some information about science to do. So when we used um, unit studies, there were some activities to do. And, and with Charlotte Mason, I follow Ambleside online. And each year they have a variety of things. So we have a nature study and the nature study this year for this term is invertebrates. And then next term will be rocks and minerals. And I think in the spring we're going to be studying fish. And so I, I kind of follow along with that. We just did a thing where we so we learned about what invertebrates were and we caught a snail. We made a little snailery for the snail. And we kept him for three days and we um, 
he had, you know, all kinds of stuff available to him and we watched him. It was fascinating. Um, and so we, I try to do things that are as can involve my kids as directly as possible. Last year, we did a month long study on weather and every day we observed the weather. We, we found out what the temperature was. We wrote down what the weather conditions were. And then we drew a picture that represented the weather. And last year was particularly fun because we had snow. We had uh, weather, yeah. <laughs> we had, yeah, we had weather of all kinds. And it was a very fun experience and, and how we talked about why the puddles were there and then what made them disappear. And then it, again, in my uh, curriculum, we also read different stories that have scientific principles. So um, they're wrapped up. Uh, it's a book called Parables of Nature, which is a really old book. Um, and you can find it just online. You can download it as a Kindle, but it's a free book. And it tells stories that teach scientific principles like the water cycle. So we have we have a lot of science, but it doesn't always look like science until later on when my son makes the connection or he'll say something and I'll say, yeah, remember that story we read about, uh, about the water? And he'll say, oh, yeah, it goes up in the air and then it does this. I'm like, yeah. So exactly. science, yeah, so science can be stories. Um, oh, those are some of the best stories. We were happy to have, like, Christian Liberty Science has a set of readers, which are is all. sitting on my desk right now. <laughs> They're yeah, they're wonderful. great. They're wonderful. The stories are good. And then there's so much information in it, lots of facts. So it appealed to my very fact based little guy who only thought he was learning if he was learning a bunch of facts, as mm -hmm. well as the kids who just love the stories. And the art is sweet. And so I'm all about finding a, a real, a living book that is something to do with science. It just makes it, it sticks with you better. Yes, um, we used a book last year to learn about the principles of water, and it's called A Drop of Water. And um, the book has the most beautiful photography I've ever seen. And the book was written and photographed by someone who obviously found water fascinating. And it has experiments in the back. And so my son was floating paper clips on water. So we talked mm -hmm. about surface tension. Mm -hmm. He was making um, his own bubble solution and blowing bubbles and learning what worked and what didn't. We were talking about how water exists in three different forms. And this was in second grade. And we, we learned so much about water. And this book is deceptively simple. It's got one or two pages that you read only a paragraph or two and we gained so much knowledge from it so it doesn't have to be uh, you know some dry curriculum where you've got a worksheet and you have to fill in the blanks and things like that I um, mean we use the form of uh, narration so I would have my son say you know tell me what he learned or what he remembered and I could gauge what he had learned he didn't have to fill out a worksheet which sometimes that will really kill the joy of learning for kids when you make everything into some kind of a, a worksheet or pen and paper type of an exercise. Everything they do is lay in some foundation. And then later on, when they start learning all the technical terms for all of those things, they'll have this huge base of experience to remember and, and to draw from. But from K through eight, they are exploring and collecting and observing and engaged with science uh, every day really it's just we need to get out there and make sure that we can facilitate that and i think we should not forget to mention the magic school bus because that whole series of books is another fun way to get a lot of science information in and they have a whole show we watched some of it recently i think it's on netflix now my son thought it was lots of fun the books are not exactly the same as the show, you know, so we had those conversations too, but there was still a lot of learning and it was, if we were studying a topic and there was a magic school bus book or program about it, we would add that to our lineup of things to do because you're coming at the same information comes at you in several different ways. That's always good to understand different aspects of it. Yes, one type of way to present the information might not really resonate, but if you keep adding those layers, it will help the kids to understand because, you know, just as we ta have talked about the learning styles, some kids will learn more 
from a hands-on. Some kids will learn more from reading. Some kids will learn more from watching something. And so the, the more layers of that that you can do, the better it will be for the kid to understand what you're trying to teach them. We have um, a rock hound at our house. So we have oh. a lot of rocks. I'm always finding rocks everywhere. And so um, we were talking recently about what gives this rock its red color. It probably has some iron ore in it. And most kids are natural collectors. They're going to get interested in something and collect it. I think one of my kids liked acorns. I seem to remember for a while we had acorns around um, and the cat would bat them around the floor. Oh, absolutely. I think this is probably the first time in a decade that I haven't had a shelf or a, a windowsill covered with rocks or something. Although we do have a place out on the front porch with the rock collection didn't go away. It just moved out to the front porch, but it makes it because we're still, you know, we're still interested in those things as adults. We don't lose that, just that interest in nature. We just kind of forget to to cultivate it as we go along. We don't want to forget, retain the world. Right, right. Um, yeah, and we try to really show appreciation for things in our house. So when my son and I are outside, maybe we just walked outside to get the mail or took the dog out. I'll point out things to him. Oh, look at that plant. That's the goldenrod. You know what? We only see the goldenrod this time of the year. It tells us we're actually in fall. Or, oh, there's a there's a beautiful rainbow. Come outside. Look at the rainbow. Um, we also go out at a full moon and we howl at the full moon. <laughs> it's just a silly thing we do. But it's but fun. And then you can learn fun. the names of the different moons. All those kinds of yes. things of being aware. And I sometimes, like if you weren't exposed to science like that when you were growing up, that might feel like a stretch or you don't know all of those kind of things to share with your children. I think that's where some of these really handy references come in, like the Handbook of Nature Study that you mentioned. And we can learn with our little ones and then pass those things along that we might not have learned. Right. I I don't remember my parents taking much notice of anything, really pointing out to me anything in the world around us. I do remember I grew up in Ohio and um, there's a tree called the Buckeye tree and we would bring in Buckeyes and my mom would be annoyed. That was about the only thing about nature yeah. that, that I remember her really telling me. And, we, and uh, so I, I try to cultivate wonder with my kids. We're going to take a short break to hear a word from our sponsor, but when we return, We'll discuss how your science education grows with your students over the years. We're nearly two weeks into the new year and maybe you're still trying to figure out how to achieve your resolutions. If you resolve to organize your homeschool materials or to save some money, Transcript Maker can help. Too many papers and records cluttering up your home office? Transcript Maker stores your transcript in the cloud so you can access it on the go, wherever you go, and streamline your record keeping. You can free up your valuable time by allowing Transcript Maker to calculate GPA for you. Just enter the grades and credits for your student, and the grade point average appears on the transcript like magic. Have you ever signed up for a free trial and they made you put in your payment information? I hate that. So shady. Transcript Maker's 14-day free trial is truly free. No need to enter your payment information, and it cancels itself after two weeks. So you can give it a test drive and see what you think without worrying about a hidden fee somewhere. When you decide to subscribe, use our exclusive coupon code HAPPY. That's H-A-P-P-Y in all caps and save 20% off the cost of your subscription. Start your new year off right with Transcript Maker. Simply better transcripts. Welcome back to the podcast. In the first half, we talked about the difference of kindergarten through eighth grade science versus high school and what science is and how to introduce it to our students. And in this half, we're going to be discussing the importance of an evolving science education. So Melody, um, what does that mean to you, an evolving science education? It means that as our children get older and more mature, the resources that we pick and the activities we choose grow up with them. So I'm not doing the same thing with my eighth grader that I did with my eight year old. The eighth grader is doing more things that are getting them ready for high school. Uh, we might be studying the same topic, but the older child is doing some more advanced study and they might be writing a lab report over the experiment that we all did together. 
or they might be using a textbook. Typically, when my kiddos got into seventh and eighth grade, I would switch over to a science textbook just so that they could start getting accustomed to the way the book was set up and be ready for high school. Good point. And that's exactly the same experience we had in my home. Um, I think we typically started more formal science around eighth grade and in ninth grade. We definitely had curriculum for high school. And, you know, you want to keep your your topics and things appropriate to the child's age. And that's one reason why we're not teaching certain aspects of biology to young kids. So how do we approach that when we are teaching combined ages? What, what did you do when you were teaching science and you had your little one room schoolhouse? Well, for many years, we all studied the same topic at different levels. And so, like we talked about books, really living books and using those in science, the younger children would be using more of the picture books or maybe the older child would be reading aloud a wonderful book to the younger ones. As time went on, it became a little bit difficult to keep that going. And so for us, I switched over to uh, textbooks with the older children. And the little ones, we continued with the uh, collecting and exploring and observing. But we also, the older ones would still be involved in that. So that would just be a fun thing that they did, but they didn't have an assignment to go with it. It just kind of, as time went on, it was harder to, I'd have a, a little group of older children learning more formally. And I was a busy mom with seven children and I would just let those older ones start tracking on their own. But we did as much as we could together. And a lot of the things that we did for, you know, science, were actually family activities. And so we were still having fun together. Right, and uh, we also had a one room schoolhouse of sorts with my five older children. The way that I would approach some of that teaching combined ages is that maybe we would all go out and put a bowl of water outside and then we'd go back the next day to observe it. And what we were looking for was evaporation. Um, the younger kids, we would just say, you know, what does your bowl look like? Where's the, where did the water go? Mm -hmm. Uh, the older kids would have to look up what was water evaporation. They might write that term in a notebook and write the definition of it. And maybe they, they would have more study on why that occurs. Um, so you can, you can take the general concept, the little kids are done with it, you know, five or 10 minutes, they can go play. And then you can explore the concept in more depth for the older student. But, but again, just like you, when I got to high school age, I had more formal resources. Sometimes that was because I wasn't really prepared to teach something such as chemistry. In the younger ages, I think we're all pretty well equipped to teach most basic scientific principles with a few resources. Were there some things you did in a systematic way to make sure you covered science? Yes, I had a plan and I had a checklist and we had a routine for the day. So there was always a place in the day where that kind of nature study or unit study was slotted into the day in order to keep things from getting just pushed out of the day because other things came up. We would have those a time where this is what we were doing. It also gave me that opportunity so that if something else presented itself, I knew where I could flex my day and I could substitute one discovery for another study and still know that we had covered science in some way that day. Or we would have, if we were doing a unit of study, we generally had some field trip or activity that we were going to do alongside our formal study or our informal study. And so that's another way we made sure to get out and go do things and go learn from things. We went and did, you know, like, um, I guess you could call it a field trip. It was a family vacation, but we went to the missions in San Antonio. And then one of them had a hands-on activity that day. We didn't even know, it was totally unplanned, where they were talking about all kinds of things like living off the land and dyeing and weaving yarn and fibers and all these kinds of things, which was like the bonanza jackpot for science for that day. And we did all the things and it was a ton of fun. It was actually part of a history study, but it incorporated so much science that I could do, I could count that as both things. So basically we made sure science happened by having a general plan for the things we wanted to cover that year. 
and then a time in the day when our little science study would happen. Sometimes science was going outside with a sketchbook and watching something and sketching it or hearing a bird and trying to find out what which bird makes that call and can we look it up and can we find a recording and can we learn the bird calls or noticing some new plant in the yard? Well, like you mentioned earlier and trying to find out what it was, because one of my goals was for us to know the names of all the native plants in our yard and in our area and learn the names of the trees. And I'm surprised to find how many people don't know about the different trees. I can't tell you what kind of a tree that was in their yard. And so that Couldn't was something. tell you a maple from an oak. <laughs> right. Or yeah. a cedar or a sycamore or whatever. So we, we made it a point to learn the names of the wildflowers and the birds and the trees and, you know, cultivated and wild plants. And so all of those were ways that just part of our lifestyle was learning about the world around us. Yeah. So you, you want to have some kind of a plan knowing what you're going to study, even if it's informal. And then you can make sure it's on the schedule so it doesn't get overlooked. And then you can plug into all kinds of events that are happening around you. So we're not studying astronomy right now, but we are always studying it in an informal way. As we talked about earlier, we know what the moon phases are and what the full moon is. We'll, we'll talk about that. And so in our community, a local library hosts star parties where astronomers bring their telescopes and set them up so that we can look through them and view different celestial objects. We just attended a star party this weekend where we got to see Saturn and the rings of it, which was fascinating. It just boggles my mind that we can be so far away and see these things. We that saw is so cool. I know. I just I think my friend and I that take our kids, I think we enjoy it more than the kids do. <laughs> The kids are usually running around and we're getting in line and we'll call them, come over here and see Saturn. Oh. We saw Jupiter and four of its moons oh, and wow. it was so cool. And we saw, we got to see the moon, uh, our moon very well with all the craters and everything. We were teasing Liam's little friend and said, oh, did you see the, um, the American flag on the moon? Oh. <laughs> and, and at first she thought her mom was serious about that. Oh, that was so funny. But yeah, we, we try to tie into things that are going on around us. Because we're studying invertebrates this term in school, we've been paying a lot of attention to the butterfly migration. We've noticed uh, praying mantises around our yard this year. We've seen a lot of praying mantises. We watched one one night walking up the window on the outside of it chasing a bug and reading books about uh, the praying mantis. We have been observing some of the beautiful orb weaver spiders and their webs. Because I knew we were going to be studying invertebrates, I was already prepped to pay attention to what was going on around us. And, um, and we do love field trips. Anything hands-on really brings the learning to stay in a person's mind. And, you know, and it becomes your learning lifestyle. So even though we might not be studying a certain thing right now, like the astronomy, we're still really into it because we've already been prepped for observation and just that's part of our life, getting outside and seeing what's going on around us. Oh, same here. And that's the kind of thing that I started with the children, but we've all continued on. It's just a different way of approaching nature, I guess. We're still fascinated by just the changes of the seasons in the yard and one year we had one tree in the yard we decided to really watch and notice when the leaves would come out and the children would write papers about what was going on with that tree that year and we learned a lot watching that one tree throughout the season and then um, as time went on that tree needed pruning and we were shocked by how tall it shot up its growth you know through the next year and so my my arborist friend was came in and explained about growth and why you prune and where you prune. It was fascinating. I learned a lot that year about that tree, but just becoming aware and noticing the world around us is a really important part of science with your little children. It definitely is. And it can be, you know, like you said, it can just be in your own yard. Um, and there are so many community events that you can tap into that are free or um, very low cost, and it will really enhance your homeschooling. 
Exactly. And if you have a state park or a national park nearby, you can find all kinds of activities and classes that they offer. Those are amazing. Yes. And the national park system has a junior ranger program and your kids can do activities at different um, national parks where they can learn about the nature aspects there and they can earn a badge. So we're, we have a routine and we're doing all these great activities. Somebody is probably wondering, well, what kind of resources would we recommend? There is a book that I've always seen at the library. I didn't buy it. I just checked it out from the library called From Mud Pies to Magnets. And it had all kinds of little, mostly things for you to think about. Oh, this is science, just activities to do with your little ones. And because uh, most homeschoolers can stretch an activity out for multiple ages, that was one that I, that I always liked to go and grab off the shelf and just look for new ideas out of it. And then another similar idea was the Backyard Scientist series by Jane Hoffman. Did oh, you that's ever... a fun series. Yeah, I, we didn't use it, but I remember um, looking through it and thinking if I hadn't already had some other items, that I would have added it to my repertoire. But yeah, that's a fun set of books and it uses regular things, right? Right. Things you probably have at home. You won't have to take a trip to the store for that. I mean, you could certainly find some extra things and make some plans. But I liked that I liked that the science was included because she loves science and we were doing science with everyday objects. So we could just the kit. It seemed like magic tricks, some of it to them, which, which mm -hmm. they thought was a lot of fun. But then there was the science behind it at the end. So. That was always a lot of fun having her books. We didn't use them consistently. They just, we dipped into them from time to time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're uh, really what, good resources. What else do you have in your stack? Well, um, when my son was very young, I found a series of books called the Hide and Seek Science books. They take a certain creature and they, they really explore it. So the ones I have on my desk right now are Hide and Seek Science, Where's That Spider? Where's that fish? Where's that bat? And where's that insect? And each book um, talks about a certain creature. Um, so for spiders, you learn about lots of different spiders and the, the drawings are really amazingly well done. And you learn to identify that creature. And then in the back of the book, it will show maybe just the silhouette of the creature or it'll show the creature without uh, identifying information. And so um, that was the beginning of our little science exploration when he was a little guy. And he still enjoys the book. So I think we've had them since he was about four. So those I, I really highly recommend. The illustrations are great and you can find them on Amazon and, and other online bookstores. The other thing that I really liked for younger kids are the Ruth Heller books. Um, she has books about all kinds of different things like camouflage. So I have a Ruth Heller book called How to Hide a Butterfly. And again, the illustrations oh, yeah. are absolutely gorgeous. And it shows these creatures, uh, you know, as their camouflage picture, and then you have to try to find it. And it's a very gentle way to teach. Uh, we have another one that's, that we read about eggs and how not only birds lay eggs, and you know, he learned that every creature has an egg. And they're just lovely books. Again, they're they're more, um, I would guess they're Charlotte Mason-y. You know, you're mm -hmm. just reading about something, but it's got a whole bunch of science wrapped up in it. And then if you wanted something that was more systematic when your kids get older, I love the top science learning systems books. And they use mostly regular things you have around, but they'll talk about a certain topic. Um, like growing radishes, you learn a bunch of science for that, or they have a magnetism one, or one about balancing. I mean, there's a tons, uh, tons of topics, and they cover a variety of uh, grade levels. I think they go through uh, like second through eighth grade mostly. They're really great resources and um, multi-age, but lots multi of new information if you want it. And at the basics, a lot of experiments that are fun to do. Those are good. And they have a good, strong math element to those uh, sciences, And they have too. little lab sheets and things that yeah. kids can start to get used to, to filling out. I also, oh. like you, love the Christian Liberty uh, science materials, the nature readers. And then they have a book called The Story of Inventions, 
which is uh, like a bunch of little mini biographies of people who invented things. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's kind of like the, the Dorling Kindersley eyewitness guides mm -hmm. to all the different science topics. My kiddos were always checking those out. We didn't really like sit down and read through them, but they're so much fun just to study a page because the a page has so much information and so many drawings and illustrations and little call outs of information that we always were picking up a DK book at the library about whatever we were studying. And those are good to add. And I guess that like if someone wanted a sequential curriculum for elementary, you could look at the Young Explorer series that Apologia has out. Mm -hmm. I have some friends who have loved going through all of those, like, you know, astronomy. They're just studying all the same things. And even if you don't want to use something like that as curriculum, there's still good reference books just to have laying around to pick up and, and dip into and find out things from. Yeah, you could use them as the spine and just get mm -hmm. your own resources, but have them as a scope and sequence. Another book that I found really helpful, um, there's a, a series called the Scholastic Reference Series. And I have one that's um, everything you need to know to know about science homework for fourth through sixth grade. And we never, you know, had homework because we're homeschoolers, but it's a very good reference <laughs> book. So that um, when you come upon a topic like matter or temperature or all kinds of, you can pick up this really quick volume, look it up, look that topic up, and it has explanations for those age groups that help you to explain things. Because I, I don't know about you, but there are things I know very well, but I struggle to explain it in a kid-friendly way. That's where a book like that is so helpful because it just gives you a good summary of the mm -hmm. high points in the right, like the correct terminology or the right way to explain it. And that sounds like a fun book to have. Yeah, yeah, they have them for other topics like math and geography, I think. But yeah, um, I, I love those little resources. And then there are just, um, there are odd books that I found, like there's one called Science Crafts for Kids, Discovery Toys, put that one out. And it just has all kinds of crafts that you can do that teach the principles of science. Oh, so good. yeah, elementary science is fun for the student and the teacher, I think. And it can still be fun as kids get into the upper grades, but you have to get a little more serious uh, as you approach eighth grade. So let's talk about what we do and that run up to high school science, which really starts in seventh or eighth grade. What, what was your approach for that, Melody? Well, I don't think I did this the first time around. You know, you have your guinea pig children that you learn. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But quickly, I discovered that there is a big jump from as far as textbooks go. Once you go from elementary junior high or middle school, whatever we're calling it now, and high school. High school is a lot more rigorous. And so after we had kind of that rude awakening of, oh my, this is this is intense, I started prepping the children a little earlier. And so in the seventh, we would start like a general science book in seventh grade. And then we'd move on into physical science in eighth grade. And basically, that is kind of the same thing twice, but they've got middle school brain fog going on. And so there's a lot of things that don't stick the first time around. It's just a good time to review and begin to do things like, uh, can you read a passage and answer questions on it? Which, if you've been narrating for years and years, that's not a hard thing to do. But can you write it down? And can you answer questions over something that you've read? And can you write a lab report? Like just the idea of that whole formal lab report, not for everything you do, because like you mentioned earlier, that would suck all the fun out of everything. Mm -hmm. But to select some things to do with an eye toward, let's learn how to write this out so that someone else could do what we did and compare their results to our results. And then what can we conclude from that? So we just started, you know, walking slowly toward a much more formal way of learning, memorizing vocabulary terms where we might know them generally, but can we memorize a definition and explain it? And even just introducing the idea of tests, because we didn't test, we just learned and collected knowledge. So then we learned how to take a test and how to study for a test, because you know, we're doing high school prep, but it's also college prep, and I wanted Indeed. them to be prepared. 
Yeah, um, a lot of homeschoolers um, don't do any kind of grading or formal um, reports in the early years. Um, but as you approach high school, especially if you are not going to be teaching some of the more rigorous sciences, the expectation that your children's uh, tutors will have, you know, if they're taking an online course or they're going somewhere to take those sciences is that they're going to be writing reports and taking tests. And it is much kinder to prepare your children for that rather than just throw them into it at first. That's true. That it will still work if you are that, you know, throw them in and sink or swim. But it's a little bit easier on the kids if they have already been exposed to that kind of uh, framework. Right. And another thing I'd like to mention about the run up towards high school is that as your children's math skills grow and they're doing more complicated math, um, that's when their science gets harder too. Science and math are closely intertwined. And so you want to be sure that um, when you're trying to add in these more difficult sciences that their math skills are ready for that. So we've gone from pre-K kinder all the way to eighth grade, but school doesn't stop there. And when you join us for the next episode, we'll get into the nitty gritty of teaching high school science. Here at the end of our podcast, we find ourselves at the news desk where we discuss homeschooling news and events happening around the country and around the world. Today, we have a very time sensitive report to share with you. SAT and ACT deadlines are coming up soon. Um, Holly, do you want to talk for a minute about why it matters that we want to take the SAT or the ACT or have our students take the tests? Sure. Well, for one thing, colleges do use the SAT and ACT scores to determine uh, whether or not a student is admitted to their university. They're not using them as much as they were since COVID, but they still are important. And college application deadlines are coming up. And so if you are applying to college, you need to have those scores available to include with your application. So it is a very timely thing. Well, if you need to plan ahead and budget for them, it's good to know when you have to register, when your registration date is for a test, and that way you can plan and budget through the year. If you can't take one now, you'll know that there's a test coming up in May and you can budget for it. Good point, because it does uh, does have a fee. Right, and even if you don't think your child is college bound, sometimes it's a good idea to go ahead and take that test for the practice and so they'll have it, because you just never know. They may decide later on after they're out of high school for a couple of years, they do want to pursue something that needs a college degree, then they'll already have that test in their That's resume. A very good point. All right, so grab a pen or go into your notes app and we're about to give you those dates. For the SAT, the test date on December 4th, you need to register by November 4th and late registration by November 23rd. The ACT test date will be December 11th, you should register by November 5th. You can register late by November 19th, but be aware that late fees do apply for late registration. And we have, uh, we'll have other test dates for you coming up in future episodes. So if you can't make these test dates or you don't wanna pay a late fee, there are other test dates coming up. You can also go to uh, collegeboard.org or act.org to look up that information if you don't wanna wait. If you have any questions, comments, or homeschool news stories, please email us at happyhomeschoolpod at gmail.com. Like our page and join our group on Facebook at facebook.com slash happyhomeschoolpod. Check out our Instagram at instagram.com slash happyhomeschoolpod. Follow us on Twitter at underscore homeschoolpod. And subscribe to the Happy Homeschooler podcast on YouTube. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Holly. I'm Melody. Happy Happy homeschooling. homeschooling. Hi, this is your host, Holly williams Zerbach. Thank you for listening to the Happy Homeschooler podcast, a Transcript Maker production. My co-host is Melody Gillum. This episode was produced by Matthew Bass and edited by Nora Williams. Our graphic design is by Pete Soloway, and our music is by The Great Pangolin. You can find her music on YouTube and Twitter at Kylie Wins. That's K-A-I-L-E-Y wins. 
If you'd like to help our podcast grow, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or as always, tell people about us. Yeah, I try to have uh, as many field guides as we could on hand. And I have one child for whom uh, entomology is a real fascinating area of study. And I don't know if it started with the field guide or if we got the field guide because he was always collecting insects. But that's one of those areas that we've got a lifelong study coming from having been encouraged to let's find out the name of that and let's find out how to classify it and what does it look like and how do we take care of it? Or can you please get that thing out of my house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 